What I do believe is that most people stack rank and prioritize certain things in a sales organization in the wrong order. And tech usually ends up at the top of that list and they wonder why they're not getting the results they want. And results are either any results, any sort of revenue coming from sales or profitable revenue. At the end of the day, we would like to make more than we spend. And so it really comes down to like a six part, I call it like a value totem pole for outbound. That is, I think, I think it's the only formula for getting outbound right today. Welcome to Revenue Insights. Every week, we'll be joined by revenue leaders from some of the most successful and highest growing companies. Together, we explore how they built their revenue teams, the journeys that they've been on, and the lessons they have learned along the way. Revenue Insights is brought to you by Ebster. We're a revenue intelligence platform designed to help revenue teams to build more pipeline, close more deals, and retain more customers. Hello there, you are listening to Revenue Insights. Today, I'm joined by Joey Gilkey, CEO of Apex Revenue. They help to fix businesses outbound as a fractional VP of sales. Joey, pleasure to chat to you today. Been enjoying some of your hot takes on LinkedIn. How are you doing? We uh, appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, they, uh, the takes are, they tend to be hot, unfortunately, for some. And we have a softer generation these days. And so it offends more people than it used to. But I'll take the attention either way. And hence, I wanted to dig into them a bit more and probe a little bit more than a LinkedIn post will allow. Before we get into that, for, for anyone listening that hasn't come across you or Apex Revenue before, could you give a bit more context on your story and your background? Sure. Yeah. So I'm again current day CEO of Apex Revenue. So we've been around for about three years now. Um, it was off the back of an exit that we had in end of 19, early 20. And so my career started in uh, ministry, actually, of all places. So I actually was in the Christian ministry world for a short stint of time. It's where I met my wife, realized pretty quickly it wasn't really where uh, my ambitions wanted to stay. I just felt this pulling to be in business, build business, create wealth, uh, give wealth to those who need it or give away some of that, a portion of that. And so I ended up my endeavors in the business world. Thankfully, when I was in ministry, I got to raise a lot of funds to support that ministry, which meant I got to rub shoulders with very wealthy people and ask them for their money. (laughs) So I kind of got my taste in sales even there. But more than that, I developed a network of folks who trusted me, liked me, saw my skill sets, saw how transferable they'd be. And uh, out the gate at a young age, I got a very sweet opportunity. I didn't see it as sweet at the time, but I saw it as a probably a fairly undeserved opportunity. I went into the enterprise sales world pretty much out the gate. And so I was selling to the Fortune 1000s of the world in my early 20s. Did very well, sold one of the largest contracts, I don't know if it's to date, but at the time in the healthcare IT space. And they thought that that instantly meant that I should be a leader of some sort just because I sold a, a big contract. They were sorely disappointed when they gave me a very large budget and a a bit of a team. I got my, for lack of better phrases, I got my teeth kicked in a little bit. But I learned a lot. Got to manage a large budget. Got to see a lot of inefficiencies at a corporate level. Decided that I hated the corporate level and decided to go take a VP of sales job in more of the consulting space. So in the small to mid-sized market, built a sales operation from scratch. They gave me a fancy title. Again, unmerited probably. But yet again, a different type of learning lesson in a sales leadership position. Took that into the marketing world where I ended up taking a a sales leadership role at a marketing firm and built up their sales operation from nothing. And then after some under-delivered promises by the founder there of equity and all the things that sometimes get dangled out there as a carrot, I decided, hey, I'm making a lot of people a lot of money by building out their sales stuff. Why don't I go build my own company? And so I set out to do that. And that was my first ever company. I went to build and, and there's a thousand of these companies now, but we were early. So this is seven, 2017 where I built, again, there's a lot of them nowadays, but a lead gen company for lack of better descriptors. We essentially did outbound sales for companies. We were very, very early in account-based. And so we went after companies who had seven figure, high six, seven, eight figure contract sizes. And we basically deal hunted for them. 
did that for about three years, exited that, and then realized that I didn't want to just be a lead gen company. And I wanted to pull on my actual experience of building sales ops and rev ops. And that's when I built Apex Revenue, which has become essentially a fractional VP of sales company with an emphasis on outbound. Nice. That was long-winded. Sorry. No, that, was, that was beautiful. And that brings us to where we are now. And, and I think uh, outbound sales is going to be an ongoing topic from today's conversation. So the first thing that I wanted to really pull out, and actually it was the one of the posts that you did that first grabbed my attention. And I'm going to read it out for the context of everyone listening, but I'm interested to hear your kind of taking it and to elaborate on it. So you should delete 80% of your sales tech stack if you really want to get outbound right. Gong, delete it. Zoom info, delete it. Salesforce, move off it. There are more tools at your disposal than ever, yet Salesforce are sucking pond water more than ever. Messaging, strategy, hiring, and leading are the only four components that matter in a sales org. If you think a software will solve your outbound problems, you deserve to lose. Now, I found this fascinating reading it as someone who works in the sales tech space, but also understand the context behind it. So I'd love to hear in your word a bit of elaboration on your point of view on that and where it's coming from, because I know a lot of the folks that are listening will be, particularly in the RevOps space, you know, probably grinding every single day, trying to get the value out of all these tools that they've invested money in. So really interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Thanks. For, uh, reading it out loud is hilarious to hear it <laughs> spoken back to me because I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. Oh, great. I've got like I'm 10. I'm not the softest individual. <laughs> i got 10 more of these. So I hope you list, like listening yeah. to uh, what you wrote. <laughs> I'll just wait for the next seven to come out. Written. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, like what's funny about that, and that went mega viral, at least LinkedIn viral. I've gotten viral on TikTok and stuff before, and that's like millions of views, but those don't really count. Whereas this one had like 700,000 views that first week. And people take it as like as an absolute, right? Like, and that's why I write it the way that I write it is there's always a layer of explanation underneath it that I don't want to give because that piss that then doesn't make it viral. It doesn't create the conversations. It doesn't get me on this podcast to talk about this. But I don't genuinely believe that someone should go and cut 80% of their, their spent on tech stack. But what I do believe is that most people stack rank and prioritize certain things in a sales organization in the wrong order. And tech usually ends up at the top of that list. And they wonder why they're not getting the results they want. And results are either any results, any sort of revenue coming from sales or profitable revenue. At the end of the day, we would like to make more than we spend. And so it really comes down to like a six part, I call it like a value totem pole for outbound. That is, I think, I think it's the only formula for getting outbound right today. And it goes in this order. It goes market fit, which you can categorize market fit as either product market fit or message market fit. If you're pioneering something, obviously you've got to have product market fit. But for most of us, if we have any competition whatsoever, there's already product market fit established. So message market fit is where most people fail in outbound. And then it goes strategy. How do we take that message to the market to get into the opportunities that we then nurture and close into revenue that's profitable? Then it's process. How do we repeatably take that strategy to market to get the message to get repeatable and systematic outcomes? And then we get into salespeople, sales leadership, and then finally sales tech, right? And I purposely put it in that order because if we don't get the top three right, the bottom three don't matter, right? And I think that we tend to jump to hire salespeople, give someone a fancy VP, CRO, sales director title, they hire a bunch of sales reps. Sales reps aren't performing. They think if they throw tech at the problem, that it's going to be it's going to solve all their problems, and it oftentimes does not. And so those companies would be better off to delete half their sales team, right? Because a couple posts later in the week, I ended up saying you should fire seventy percent of your sales staff, right? You'd be better off getting rid of most of your sales team and getting rid of most of your sales tech and going after and solving messaging, strategy, and process before you ever go get tech involved. So that's kind of the premise there. That's my core belief. As it relates to sales, you can't move me off of that position. I've yeah. seen it too many times. I, I thought you were going to go in harder on that, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, oh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> we're just getting warmed up, brother. <laughs> we'll save that for after dark. <laughs> I think yeah, I completely agree. And I think you make a great point. And um, we were kind of talking about it beforehand. But for businesses that you're going into, what is the most common one of those that, that they're failing on overlooking? Message market fit. 
because I think that there are multiple strategies to get an outcome. It may not be the most optimal outcome, but you can get an outcome through whether you choose account-based or you choose campaign-based, high volume, low volume, high personalization, low, per- you can still get a result. Is it the most optimal? No. So strategy, I wouldn't say is the most important. It's the second. But I do think that that message market fit is the absolute most important. If you do not have that, do not pass go. And certainly don't go buy fucking six cents. <laughs> or whatever your intent data or gong. Your conversational intelligence doesn't really matter if your messaging is wrong. Mm. Yeah, which I think is a really valid point. Um, the messaging point obviously speaks to me as a marketer because that's what we obsess over, right? Whether it's our ads, whether it's literally this podcast, whether it's you know, the content that we're creating, if we're putting out a message that our audience think, well, this is just a load of rubbish, then it gets us nowhere. So what's your approach then when you go into a business? How do you start to solve that problem in terms of working out what a good message is? We are unique in the sense that we will solve that problem for them, to, with them, but a lot of it for them. So we are a fractional VP of sales company. So we will come in and be that sales leader who actually knows what the hell we're doing. Right. And we will build the sales operation. We will build sales technology. We will help them hire. We will manage those sales reps in a fractional capacity. Right. But before we even do that, before I tell you to spend all that money with us and to spend all the money on the tech and to spend all the money on the sales hiring, we have to get the hire or we have to get the messaging and the strategy right. And so we tried to put that on the client, the messaging at one point. And we often found that they don't want to do the work to figure out what is that message market fit. And so then we said, okay, cool. In order for us to be more successful, we need to help you get to message market fit quicker. So we developed a process. We call it outbound R&D. It's a research and development process of about six to eight weeks, depending on the complexity. And what we do is we jump in, we figure out, and we make assumptions on what we believe message market fit is for outbound. Right. So just mind you, I'm a predominantly outbound focused individual and company. We actually go in, we determine what do we think messaging looks like for outbound. And then we go test it. So we develop target account profiles. We go build lists. We segment that data. We determine what channels we want to test. And then we, my team that I've built, we will go to market for you. I don't want to waste your dollars on your sales team that we don't know can work or your tech stack. Like We've got all the things to go test. And our entire goal is to go have hundred or hundreds of conversations with that ideal buyer. And we take that message that we made assumptions on, hypothesis, and we go test that message, refine it, test it, refine it, make iterations until we feel like we get to a conversion rate that is acceptable in our eyes. Or we can't get there and we have a serious problem with message market fit. And so in those six to eight weeks, we have called 100 conversations with your target account, your buyer personas, your buying committee members. And we will determine the outcome of your messaging will be based on how successful we are in that time. And then once we have that, we feel good. We have data, we have scripts, we have recordings, we have messaging, we have copy, we have all the things that we can then feel good about going and building your sales operation on top of because we've secured both the message and the strategy. We know what channels are viable now because we've tested them. We've gotten conversions on them. We know the message that works, the scripts, et cetera. So that's how we go about solving it. But if you're not hiring us, then how I would do it is do just that, is go build your list make assumptions on your messaging and be willing to have conversation in tranches of five to 10 conversations, be willing to receive the feedback. What I see oftentimes a lot of companies is they make assumptions on their messaging. They go test it and they think it's something wrong with the buyer. It's like brother, sister, at the end of the day, it comes down to you, right? The the buyer is the one with the checkbook. And yes, I believe in challenger sale. And yes, you have to educate the buyer on how to buy. Yes. But at the end of the day, if the message doesn't land, that's on you. And so that's not a problem with the buyer. And so we have to craft a message that fits with the buyer. And so I would go out, I would make a commitment that we do not go hire more salespeople. We do not go sign up for more two-year contracts with Zoom Info for God knows why, right? I wouldn't go sign up for Gong yet. I would simply go say, we're not going to do that until we have at least 100 conversations and we get a conversion rate on those conversations north of 7%, 10% up to 15 to 17%. And when we get there, then let's go build the team. Let's go enable the team with more tech. How do you gauge the success of that? Is it just based on conversions at the end of it? Or are you like measuring tracking anything else? Not necessarily. We look at a couple things. So when we go and do it, we are looking at, yes, a conversion number, but everyone's different with their buying windows. And 
you might have hit the window wrong. You might have there's the whole adage of the statistic of like three percent of your market's buying, seven percent is willing to hear you out and honestly could buy. There's 30% that hasn't been thinking about this, but they're persuadable to have a conversation and get the ball rolling. There's probably another 30% that is not ready right now. It's not a priority for a while. And then there's the final 10 to 20% that are just, they're never going to buy. They're never going to solve that problem. I think it's important to have enough conversations to where you hit most of that, those different segments to get feedback from them. Because it's not just about how many calls are we going to turn into sales ops, right? Opportunities. But it's also about how many of these accounts do we activate for later, right? Are they in the market soon, eventually? If so, I want to break down when I had these conversations. I want to be able to look at all the conversations that I had. And I want to get a percentage breakdown of where people ended up. Yes, interested now. Cool. What's the percentage of our conversation that did that? Yes, not interested now, right? But not never. What percentage of my list is that? No. Not me, meaning we have our buyer persona wrong or our buying committee wrong. And we have to go find who it is that we are supposed to go after either through referral or better research. Or no, never. We're never going to solve this problem. It's not a priority for us, whatever, right? And I want to figure out what that percentage is. And I want to make sure that I'm just, I'm looking at that percentage and seeing if it's in line with that 3, 7, 30, 30, and 20% breakdown. Ideally better. Hopefully that answers somewhat. Yeah, that does. And what was coming up to me as you were talking, because everything that you describe is, it feels to me is almost like common sense, where it's like, you know, we're speaking the same language here. And what also, what's also coming up as we talk is, if I put myself in the shoes of a VP, VP of sales, and I'm short of my number for this quarter, and my board or my CEO is going, what the hell is going on here? And then it's like, well, and this, I mean, you know, maybe I've listened to this podcast with Joey and I, I want to test my messaging because I'm convinced our messaging is where we're falling short and I'm going to need six weeks to test this out. I feel like they're going to be going, oh, there's no way we're giving you six weeks. You've got to hit your number. So to those folks who are, for most VP of sales, who are you know, really being driven to hit that number every single quarter, and there's a huge amount of pressure on it. What would your advice be to them? It would be, remember this moment. The sins of your past will haunt you <laughs> first. <laughs> right? You got here because you didn't do the heavy lifting on the front end. That's mm-hmm. okay. You'll learn from that. Right? It's not a loss if you learn. Secondly, if you're like, shit, I do have to get it in gear. Then go to your existing customers. Ideally, try to find some who came through inbound or uh, outbound channels. If you're trying to get outbound sales, right? right? Or if it's inbound, then go to your inbound converted customers. And sit down with them, be willing to pay for that time, right? Have it come out of the sales department's budget if you need. And say, hey, listen, where were you before? Right? Go talk to this specifically, look back. Who was the decision maker? Who was in the buying committee? Who had those conversations with you? Where were you before? What was your biggest issue? Why did you convert? Do you remember anything in the sales process that really pushed you over the edge of like, yeah, we need to do this? And do basically reverse research and development on people who have converted already. Now, they're already a little bit biased towards you because they've been working with you, assuming they're seeing success. So you have to hold out the grain of salt. But go backwards and look at who has already converted because those conversations are much easier to drum up, right? And then take that data and then bring it to, okay, now how do we do forward research and development? Just because you don't have six weeks does not mean that you shouldn't still start the process, right? And so still try to have the conversation and try to have better assumptions now that you've at least gone backwards to the research and development of your past clients who've converted from different channels. Take that data, make assumptions, see if it actually converts in live time, but also be willing to go have conversations in the R&D type of capacity, not just in I need to have conversions capacity. That would be my biggest thing. And I would say my first piece of advice is probably the more important one, which is learn from this. Right. This is why things didn't work. This is why we're here. I do want to help you now. But I think that the biggest advice I can give you for your future is to realize that you're here because you didn't do this when you started. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like that. <laughs> and I do say it's the way of the world, right? We learn from our mistakes and uh hey, and you know what we you're go about me, Lee. I have made my money. I have made my money. I don't need to work. I don't need anyone else's approval. I don't need anyone else to love me. That's why I can write the way I write LinkedIn. I will tell you exactly what you need to hear. 
and we'll never have to sugarcoat it. And that's not a flex. It's just a, this is where you need to work towards getting in your life, whether you work for someone or you own your own thing, is get to a place where you can be unapologetically you. That's a philosophical little Oof. nugget for you guys listening. I live on a 70 acre ranch and live the way I want to live because of this, the decisions that I've made in my past and the advice that I was willing to heed from people above me. And I think all of you who are listening probably want to get there. And so that should be a goal that you have on your goal board or whatever you do in your morning routines is get to a place where you can be unapologetically you and give people the advice they really need. I've got the 70 acre ranch on my goal board as well. So that's one nice. There you go. Um, do it. And with that in mind, I actually um, want to change track slightly from messaging into something that you mentioned earlier that I know you've been talking about, which is around to sack 50% of your reps tomorrow. And um, yeah. that, that aligns with something that we've been seeing coming a lot as coming up a lot as well in terms of, I guess, more broadly, quota attainment. We ran some analysis recently that showed that 23% of sellers are making up 83% of business revenue. It's a pretty startling number. I think everyone had kind of a gut feeling behind it, but to see it on paper was kind of like, oh, wow, this is actually a pretty serious problem. And actually kind of nicely aligns with, I think, what, what you're seeing as well, right? So my simple question is why? Why are more than 50, you know, three quarters of sellers dropping short of hitting their number? Are you familiar with the Pareto principle? I am, yeah. Yeah, it's 20. Yeah. And what were the numbers you just gave me? 43% are driving 83% of the results. Mm -hmm. It's almost identical. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's higher power that dictates these laws or if it's a universal thing or whatever. I think that a lot of things fall in line with 80-20. Why well, I said delete 80% of your tech stack. Why I believe I was being generous when I said let go of 50%. That's why my next post the next day was it actually should be 70. And I probably should have wrote another one that said that actually should be 80. Again, I don't truly mean that as an absolute statement either. But at the end of the day, most things in life, 20% of what you do, 20% of who you employ, et cetera, drive 80% of the results. It doesn't mean that you have to get rid of everybody. It just means that knowing there will always be a disparity between the top 20% and the results that you want from the rest. And so what I have found is I would far rather invest more resources into the smaller category, the minority producers in my sales organization that are driving 80% of the results. And then my job as the sales leader, the rev ops leader, the CEO, whatever your title might be, who's over top of this, my job is to make that 20% that's producing 80% of the results, the new average. Like that's my job. That's what I want to create. And so I want my next 80-20 I want the 20% that were or the 80% that aren't producing as well as the top 20%. I want those 80% to look like the old 20%. And that, that might mess some people up, but I'm, I know some people are visual. But at some point, you have a 80-20. 80% of people aren't doing what they should or aren't producing to the level of the top 20%. But my job is to then turn the new 20%, call it a year later, into like the all-stars that would have crushed the 20% in the former version of our sales organization. And now the 80% we do have look a lot like the old top performing 20% in the old organization, right? That's our job. But I think your question was, why is it that way? So outside of giving you the, this is a principle that seems to be universal to some degree in more realms than just sales. I think that, that sales reps are a couple things. Some are controversial, some are not. One is I think that you've got to do the top three right, right? If they don't have, if you're not equipping them with good messaging, it's just the cream will still rise to the top and they will figure out messaging on their own. But in terms of equipping a sales team, you're just not. You're not giving them the right messaging tools, if you will. Maybe you have them doing the wrong strategy or you're optimizing for the wrong outcomes, right? Like I think that one statement that used to be a core value of our company was outcomes over inputs. And I think oftentimes we manage people to KPIs so closely to KPIs of like lagging indicator KPIs. Right, like your close rate is here and it needs to be here. It's like, yes, agreed. How? How? Well, just tell me I have to. How do I get there? I'm obviously doing what I'm supposed to be doing. At least that's what I'm doing. I'm told I'm putting in the 100 dials a day. I'm sending the 50 emails a day. I'm making the 25 LinkedIn connections a day. And yet, I've only got this many opportunities. My conversion rate's too low. My push to pipeline ratio is too low. My close rate's too low. I'm doing the inputs you told me to do, and yet the lagging indicators, the KPIs that you tell me are, are important, 
close rates, not producing. Why? And that's where the VP of sales, the sales leader, the rev leader, the CEO needs to do the hard work of answering that question of why. So to sum all that up, I think that sales reps are managed to the wrong metrics. They're managed to inputs. They are not managed to outcomes. And we try to keep them in a box of inputs instead of saying, I want you to go out there and get the outcomes that I ask for. Revenue influence. That's one. And then I think two, this is the more controversial take. I think sales reps are f***ing entitled. They have become more entitled than ever. And here's why. And it's our fault. It's employer's fault. It's leader's fault. Because we have gotten to the point now, and I think COVID played a role in this. I think that a lot has, has created this where sales reps, SDRs, are now getting paid the equivalent of three-year-ago account executive, right? And account executives are getting paid the equivalent of a sales leader in some cases. And sales leaders are also falling in suit, and they're getting paid the level of a, a C-suite sales leader, right? And so we get to this place where it's nearly impossible to turn a sales organization profitable because of the demand on what it costs, right? And you layer on top of that, that every organization is now battling over their tech stack. Oh, you come over here, we have Gong. Come over here, we have better data, we have Zoom Info. Come over here, we've spent a million dollars on our Salesforce build out. And these sales reps are like, oh, I want to go to that organization because they spent more on their tech stack. It's going to make my life easier. And so they go to a place where the messaging's not good, the strategy's not good, they're measured on inputs, and they're measured on inputs because they're given technology that says that, hey, you can hit your inputs easier. And yet the outcomes are not coming out profitably. And we sit here with our hand on our head wondering why. And I think that's the answer. And it has turned them soft. Two really fascinating Clip points it. that I've marked it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to actually grab on from your first point. You were talking about the lagging indicators. And I think a lot of people listening will be feeling like resonating with this idea of, oh, well, let's just add more in. Let's just, you know, more activities, more calls, more emails. In a marketing world, it's, well, let's just spend more marketing dollars and we're just going to get more at the end, right? And then it doesn't work out that way. And you kind of rhetorically pose the question that leaders asking, like, why? Why is that the case? Why do you think that is the case? And what would you say are the leading indicators of revenue for those reps? Yeah, I think the lagging is obviously revenue, revenue influence, close rates. I'll start with the what are leading indicators. I think it's case by case. It's a little bit different. But I do think that, sure, there's conversion metrics on there. I'll give you a good example. So... I'm analyzing the data of a $12 million marketing agency that sells high-end Drupal website developments to Fortune 1000 type companies. Okay. So they know their target accounts. They know what they sell. When I look at the data beneath the data beneath the data, and I understand that they're making, let's just say, in the past six months, they have a small team. Past six months, they made 3,900 dials. Whether that's too much or too little is a completely subjective case by case, right? Some people just might be like, oh, they're not making enough volume. Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, totally maybe. Or maybe not. And then you go a layer deeper and you say, okay, well, what's their dial to connect rate? Huh, that's interesting. So the dial to connect rate is on 3,900 dials, they've only had 79 connections. That's abysmally low. That's 2%. Okay. So that means that they have an issue connecting with who they deem as their decision maker. You look a layer deeper and you realize that of the connections they had, they're only converting, I think the number was 1% of those conversations or connections. All right, that's really, really bad. So a 1% conversion on a 2% connection on 3,900 dials, that's six conversions, roughly, on 3,900 dials. So if I look at those numbers, what that tells me is a couple of things. And again, there's more layers we can get into, but it tells me a couple of things. One, you have probably poor data, or you've not determined what is the best number to dial. Right? So you've not done the heavy lifting on what dial should we be going, or your data source is bad. Right? Maybe you're using Zoom Info or you're using Slintel, which is attached to Sixth Sense, or you're using Apollo's data or whatever your data might be, your segment data is not great. And so you have a poor data process. And so what that tells me, I can reverse engineer and I can look at based on the volume of dials you're doing, 
the connection rates you're getting and the conversion rate on those connections that you're getting, I can tell that you're going to have a conversion every 29 days. That is unsustainable, Jimmy, not his real name. But I'm going to look and be like, this is just unacceptable. We can't keep accepting this. And we've been doing this for six months. And you don't know how to look at the data on the front end. And the data tells you a story. And so you don't need fancy tools. You just need data that tells you what the numbers are on the front end. And then you need to know how to turn that data into a story that helps you solve a problem. And so it's a data problem, et cetera. Here's the layer deeper. I go to the 78 connections they had, and I found that 42% of those was either a referral, aka it was not me, wrong person, or it was wrong person in the organization, no referral. So what you're telling me is, even of the 3,900 dials I had and the 78 connections I had, only 30-something of those were relevant. So I have a buyer persona issue. I'm going after the wrong title, the wrong buying committee. I think this person makes the decision, but 42% shows me it's not. So who are they referring me to? That needs to become the new buyer persona or the new key buyer in my buying committee, right? And those are the things, those are the leading indicators of lagging success. Of course, their revenue's down. Of course, they're not closing, right? That was a lot. I could go deeper, but that's the things you have to look at is what are the things leading up to that? The other aspect is that's all objective. You have to look at subjective. So something that we install in every company, and this is probably the best, most practical advice you could have in your company right now is you need to have a daily shutdown scorecard. I literally believe in this so much that I built an internal software for our VPs. That This is how we manage sales reps for all of our clients. Have a daily shutdown scorecard where they have to manually report. I know, you could have APIs all you want. (laughs) but They have to manually report and go find their own data and put it in. Why? Because they have to be personally accountable to their numbers. Yes, you can go pull those reports in Salesforce. It's easy. But I want to have them manually go find it themselves, put it in my scorecard so that they are personally accountable to the leading indicators. Simultaneously, one of the other questions that we ask in the daily shutdown scorecard is subjective answers, right? So objective is your production. Subjective is how do you feel? What are you struggling with? What are you experiencing on the ground, boots on the ground in your conversations? What do you feel like you're getting hung up here? And they will oftentimes tell you intuitively what they believe is wrong. It might be wrong, might be right doesn't matter, but they are giving you data as a sales leader who's monitoring these manual daily shutdown scorecards on what they need. And if you're not giving them what they need, then it's on you. I love the point at the end there, particularly on, I guess, qualitative feedback, right? Which it's very easy to go, oh, I've got all this data, you know, I'm going to make a decision based off the back of it. Now we're going to go and do it. And it's just like, okay, on to the next thing now, off it goes and runs. And I'm just going to go and look back at the data then in a week's time. Super fascinating point and i love actually the layer that you were going into right and particularly around the point of personas we personally would look at it from the perspective of at the end you know looking at those close one deals you know which personas are most likely to be involved as part of your successfully won sales processes which are you spending loads of time engaging and spending loads of time sending your emails to and so on and so forth but they never close right and all of that starts to feed back into the original journey in terms of owning in or rather than going loud and proud and going as wide as possible, actually starting to narrow it down into where you're actually generating results. Yeah. And again, like coming back to strategy, like it's okay to have those conversations and connections with people who aren't the buyer. If you're taking the account based approach and you have a much more targeted list, right? It's okay to talk to, we call it key buyer is a level, buying committee is a level and frontlines members is a level, right? And the way we define that is key buyer writes the check, has to raise the hand. Buying committee is they just can't be thumbs down, right? They can either be neutral or or for you, but they might influence the decision in some way, shape, or form. And then front lines are typically people who are affected or impacted by your solution. But you can get data from them, but whether they're for you or against you doesn't really matter. It's just they can they're good for data, they're good for helping you find a decision maker. So you can talk to the wrong people, that's fine. It seems to be part of your strategy. Yeah, absolutely. And email has all those leading indicators too. I went cold call, but you can go email, LinkedIn, you can do that same, you know, open rate, bounce rate, response rate, positive reply, conversion rate, all those different metrics tell you a different story. Yeah. I want to ask you a penultimate question. And because you've touched on it a few times, of the three bits of text that you need, CRM, sales enablement, and then good data, which I think we've covered quite nicely in today's episode. I want to know, let's imagine I've got my messaging down. I've got a strategy in place and it's yeah. wor- working, right? What's my stack? What's, well, I just want to know what the fourth one is that you're like, you know what? 
of all of the tech out there, this is the one that you'd most commonly recommend. So again, this is dependent upon your strategy, but let's just say I'm an account-based guy at my core, right? Like I mentioned, I've landed one of the biggest deals in the history of this big company because I know how to break into accounts. It's, it's not rocket science. It just takes a little bit of thought. And so honestly, if I was, if I was to add a fourth one and, and account-based was really important to me or lower volume, higher conversion, aka higher personalization, is going to be a key driver for me, then there's a difference between a data tool and a researching tool, right? Right. A data tool oftentimes gives you public facing data that is, you need it to do your outreach, right? So that's your your numbers, your mobile lines, your landlines, your direct numbers, your headquarter numbers, your emails, your LinkedIn profiles, etc. Research is more about at a contact level, what is important to this person what means something to them, both in their personal life and their professional life. And so if I was to introduce a piece of tech that is additional to a CRM, a sales engagement tool, and a data tool, it would be a research tool. So a good example right now, one that I'm testing, I can't say I endorse it because, again, I don't know your case study or your use study, is clay.run. So clay has kind of jumped on the scene recently. Very cool. You can play with AI in there and all that fun stuff. Again, I care about tech, but I care about it after everything else. We have everything else dialed, so I'm, I get to play with tech because it's fun. And I get to optimize and make more efficient, more effective. But Clay helps you essentially build your own scripts, if you will, of... I don't mean scripts like a call script. I mean scripts like running a script code type of thing, where you can upload or import or have an API send your list of contacts you want to go after. And you can set rules for each column of the spreadsheet that runs a script. And so an example might be, hey, for this person, I want you to validate these, this data numbers, emails, etc. But I also want you to find an about page on their website URL that has their name on it. If there is one, if there is not one, skip. Link to it. Great. The next is I want you to look for keywords in their LinkedIn content of the history of their LinkedIn content that has these keywords in it. Link to it. You can kind of get the idea. That speeds up research process. And so For me, if I was adding a tool, I'd have CRM, sales engagement data, and a tool that enables me to research better because I know that if I can interpret that research, I can make my emails more personalized. I can make my hook in my phone call more personalized, right? If I could call a decision maker right now and I found out that they love collecting Rolexes and I currently have a a Rolex Batman on, I can call it to, hey, listen, this is a cold call. Yes, I want to talk to you about what what, what I'm actually calling, but more importantly... What Rolex are you wearing today? Another important, right? I've broken the ice. He's going to give me the 30 seconds after, right? If I can be equipped with that in my sales process and my sales rep has that information, they know how to use that, right? Our metrics, talking about leading indicators, are going to skyrocket. So that's what I would add. I love that. Excellent recommendation. All right. Last question. I think you're going to like this one. What is one book that you would recommend to other sales or revenue <laughs> And this could be fiction if you want it to be, nonfiction. Take this however that you want to take this. Okay. I'm not going to make it about sales, but it, you can always bring it back to sales. I'm a master wordsmither, but I, I, will not, I will not try to bring it back to sales. I'll just give you <laughs> a very powerful book. It's a very unknown book, and it can be a little trippy if you read it. So a lot of people have heard of, especially a lot of entrepreneurs or people who've kind of like gone out to like build wealth in real estate or in their own business and they've taken the ambition there. And neither way is better, right? I think that some number twos, number fives and companies are far better off than being a number one. They're just not wired that way. Nonetheless, there's a book that is, is far less unknown by Napoleon Hill. So Napoleon Hill is famous for the Think and Grow Rich. Great book, highly recommend it. will probably change your life too. But he has another very, very unknown book called Outwitting the Devil. And it's essentially a narrative book of his recollection of a conversation that he had with, in air quotes, the devil, right? And so whether it's actually took place or it's just his way of communicating a very unique message, this book was never published for 70 years or 80 years after he wrote it. It wasn't until after he and his wife had passed that his family allowed it to be published, I believe in 2011. And it's a fascinating book because... It has shaped a lot of my philosophy on life and it shapes, it comes out a lot in my content of the importance of thinking, the importance of your mind, because the whole book premise, and I want to ruin it for some people, it's a shorter book, but the whole premise is basically, 
he's talking to the devil and he's basically has the floor with the devil or the devil has to answer his questions. And so he asked the devil, he goes, how do you get what you want to get in life? How do you turn 98% of people into slaves, basically? And a lot of it comes down to, I get them to stop thinking for themselves. I get them to just have the, I follow the herd mentality. And I think for myself and I, I believe what I am told as opposed to I sit down and I have deep thoughts about why is this the way it is? And so that can be applied to sales and be applied to your life or whatever. But I think that, and go read it yourself. But I think at the end of the day, if you can learn to think, then you can become a master problem solver in every aspect of your life, including sales or marketing or whatever your, your ambitions might be. Oof, hot takes and hot book recommendations as well. I love that. Yeah. I want to give you one that no one else is ever going to recommend. So <laughs> that comes down to, that just, that's more my personality anyways. I don't yeah. want to give you Challenger Sale or something like that. Yeah, but you know, surprisingly, it's only come up once, actually. Challenger Sale? Only one duplicate so far. I'm quite impressed because I feel, ah. like, I feel like everyone goes, oh God, don't say the thing that everyone else has already said. Uh, yeah, challenger <laughs> Sale, Gap Selling, Challenger Customer. How to Win you Friends know, and Influence People. That's yeah, usually they, the one I expect to come up. Yeah, they Can Go Rich, I'm sure, is on there, but yeah. no one, I guarantee no one will ever read. Unless they listen to this podcast and they take my recommendation, they'll never offer that book. It's actually hard to find unless you know you're looking for it. Well, I kind of want to read it, so I'm going to have to... Uh... <laughs> you should. It's a great listen, too. If you're an audiobook guy, it's a great listen. Amazing. Right, Joey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed digging into things today. For anyone listening that is like, you know what? This guy's talking a lot of sense. I want to hear more of that. You've already kind of teased to me that you've got seven more really interesting posts like lined up to come out. <laughs> so uh, for anyone that wants to read and hear more, where can they find you? Yeah, just go to LinkedIn. LinkedIn.com forward slash IN forward slash Joe Gilkey. Hit me up on Twitter. I don't talk anything about sales, but I talk a lot about other things, I believe. And so that's more of my platform to vent on other shit that I... <laughs> want to talk about but LinkedIn is probably the most applicable so come find me there if you're a company and you want to talk to Apex just go to apexrevenue.com awesome we'll put links to all those down below and if I can find that book recommendation I'll include a link to that as well we'll see how it goes yeah I'll send you a link <laughs> highly recommend awesome thank you Joey really appreciate it and to everyone that's listened this week we'll catch you next week thanks for listening to Revenue Insights if you want to learn more subscribe to our newsletter and we'll deliver every episode straight to your inbox. If you have any questions, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Our links will be in the episode notes. See you next week.